Hi, and uh, welcome to Fresh Vision Church. I want to begin by thanking everyone out there who may be watching or listening to this message. It truly is an honor that we that you've given us your attention. And I hope that by the time I'm done here, that this message completely blesses you. If you have any questions or have any prayer requests at all, you can let us know by going to fecelp.org and filling out the electronic message form that we have towards the bottom of our web of our web page and submitting it to us when you do it'll come to one of us and we will get back to you as soon as possible as soon as we can now as many of you have probably heard due to the current coronavirus pandemic many churches across the nation have decided to not publicly gather as church and have opted instead to either stream live stream their church services um, with no one inside or to record their services um, this week for this reason and for many others I have I made the decision I actually came to it last night to postpone services until next week at least however just because no one's here that doesn't mean that we still can't have church so I'm here recording this message um, to do what I normally do around this time on Sunday share a message and preach the gospel like I mentioned in last week's announcement the decision on whether or not we'll be meeting together will be on a week-to-week -week basis and ultimately the final decision on whether we'll be meeting or not meeting will be made on Saturday evening now let me also add this because small churches like us rely heavily on the tithes and offerings to pay the rent and to pay the bills having no one here makes that just a little bit more challenging makes it just a little bit more difficult so we hope that you would consider helping us out with a small financial donation if possible if you can a PayPal option is available on our website again FECELP and if you scroll all the way to the bottom you'll see that uh, the, that PayPal button or you can just send us a check to our address here and again that information you can find on our website now if you can't do that let me just say this your prayer are just as valuable or even more valuable than anything any monetary funds anything that you can give we need your prayers my family needs your prayers um, the church here needs your prayers and our, our country our city our state needs prayers so with that being said I let's begin with this morning's message last week the Lord showed us the showed us the kinds of attitude his followers should have in the face of persecution and he warned them about having a proper attitude regarding material possessions in the passages we'll be covering today Jesus will continue to warn his disciples a couple of ways or he will warn them in two other ways he warns them not to worry about their basic needs and to always be ready to always be prepared for his return thus this week's message 
will focus on how having an eternal perspective will keep you from worrying about how your present needs will be met and having, how having an eternal perspective will prepare you for when he comes back, when Jesus Christ comes back in all his glory and majesty. So let's open up with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you that you have given us this day. Thank you that you've allowed me to be here to prepare this message. And I pray that you use me in a mighty way now to, to share your word. I ask that you speak mightily through this message. You want to hear from me, Lord, this morning. We're hungry for you, especially in this time of confusion, fear, anxiety. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Last week we left off in verse 21, and we'll be picking up in verse 22 this morning. Luke chapter 12, verse 22. Then he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat, or about the body, what you will wear. For your life is more than food and your body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They don't sow or reap. They don't have a storeroom or a barn, yet God feeds them. Aren't you worth much more than the birds? Can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? If then you're not able to even to do even a little thing, why worry about the rest? Consider how the wildflowers grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass, which is in the field today and is thrown in the first tomorrow, how much more will he do for you, you of little faith? Don't strive for what you should eat and what you should drink, and don't be anxious. For the Gentile world eagerly seeks all these things, and your Father knows that you need them. But seek His kingdom, and these, thing, and these things will be provided for you. Don't be afraid, little flock, because your Father delights to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Make money bags for yourselves that won't grow old, an inexhaustible treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. A submarine was being tested and had to remain submerged for many hours. When he returned to the harbor, the captain asked, how did the terrible storm last night affect you? The officer looked at him in surprise and explained and exclaimed, storm? We didn't even know there was a storm. The sub had been so far beneath the surface that it reached the area known to sailors as the cushion of the sea. Although the ocean may be whipped into huge waves by high winds, the waters below are never stirred. The Christian mind will be protected against the distracting waves of worry if it's resting completely in the good providence of God. There, sheltered by His grace and encouraged by His Holy Spirit, the believer can find the perfect tranquility that only Christ can provide. In this passage that we just read, the Lord shows His disciples how to have an eternal perspective in spite of the worries of life. The Lord begins by saying, Therefore I tell you. This means that everything that He's about to say is directly related to what He had just previously said. Now, in the last section that we covered a week ago, Jesus told a parable of a rich young farmer 
who had many temporal possessions. He had a lot of stuff, but he had none for eternity. Sure, again, he had many things. He had a lot of stuff, but he didn't have an eternal perspective. He didn't have an eternal outlook. And as a result, he lived without God, died without God, and would now spend eternity without God. Well, unlike the rich young farmer who had more than enough to live by, Jesus knew that one of the challenges his disciples would regularly face throughout their life in ministry would be fear, would be fear and worry. Fear of where the next meal would come from and worry that their basic necessities, such as clothing, would not be met. I like what a pastor once said, greed and worry are closely related. Greed can never get enough. Worry is afraid it will never have enough. Both share a common denominator though. Neither of them have their eyes on Jesus. So to develop in them an eternal perspective, he follows up the parable of the rich farmer with a lesson on worry. At the end of verse 22, the Lord first tells them what not to do, and in verse 23, he explains why. With a simple and powerful command, he tells them, don't worry. The word worry, which appears two other times here, is the catchword that unites this small section and literally means stop being worried. So by telling them not to worry, he was also implying that they should be content instead. But then he goes on to tell them what they shouldn't worry about. And there he says, don't worry about your life, what you will eat, or about the body, what you will wear. See, one of the greatest dangers in the Christian life is that the acquisition of food and clothing becomes the first and foremost, foremost aim of our existence. That is the only purpose that becomes the only purpose of living. We can be easily become, we can become easily so occupied with earning money for these things that the work of the Lord is relegated to a secondary place. It's, we put it in the back seat, hoping that it never comes up. But if you look carefully, you'll discover that the emphasis of the New Testament is that the cause of Christ should be the priority in our lives. Anything and everything else like food and clothing ought to come after that. Now, this isn't an excuse not to work or to earn a living. Those who are able to should work hard for the supply of their current necessities. In fact, 2 Thessalonians 3.10 says, Those unwilling to work will not eat. But as those current needs are supplied, we must trust God for the future as we plunge ourselves into His service. This is the life of faith. He then explains that the central core of life is more than food and clothing. Now, this also isn't intended to dismiss the pleas of someone deep in deep poverty. Yes, such a person needs to trust God to provide what they need to survive. However, he or she needs to be able to trust that God will use his people 
as instruments to care for his needy people. So verse 3 is actually directed at people who have more than what they need, yet spend their time figuring out ways to get more and worrying about how to keep it. Let God take care of the essentials, Jesus declared. You just be sure you're prepared to face the judgment. Certainly, if you're not going to worry about the basics, then don't worry about the rest either. Why? Because worry isn't part of God's menu for living. It's important then that you let the Holy Spirit lead your decision-making process and trust Him to lead you in a meaningful life or trust Him to lead you to a meaningful life. The more you trust in Him, the more you'll have an eternal perspective of, about what really matters in this world and in the world to come. So after having explained uh, that a person who worries doesn't have a proper perspective on life, Jesus then gave a few other reasons why one shouldn't worry. And he uses two illustrations to do that. In his first illustration, the Lord uses, used ravens to show that God cares for his people. Ravens, he says, don't sow or reap. Nor do they build places to store food in. Thus, they never know where today's food is coming from, much less tomorrow's. Yet, he goes on to explain, God feeds them. So if God provides for those ravens, don't you think you're worth much more to him than those birds? Well, let me tell you, you are. Just read verse 7. Just read over again verse 7 here in chapter 12. There it says, Indeed, the hairs of your head are all counted. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. You see, God knows the needs of everything He created. And since He values you, since He values you more than birds, you can trust that He'll also meet your needs. Because it was you who sent His Son to die for. And it was you whom He saved by His grace. This means that you belong to Him. And as his servant, whenever you're in need, you can look to the promise he made here. And in Philippians 4.19, there Paul said, God will supply all your needs according to his riches in the glory in Christ Jesus. The Lord then asks if any of them can add one moment to their lifespan by worrying. In other words, can all your worries add a single moment to your life? The answer is, of course, no. Worrying won't make you live longer. Rather, according to medical professionals, the stress of worry can actually subtract years. Stress not only causes pains and aches from bad posture, but it's also one of the greatest contributors to disease and poor health. The point of verse 26 is that if worry can't even accomplish something as simple as adding a moment to a person's life, then why worry about bigger things? Bigger things that we have no control over, such as the future. Rather, let us use all our strength and time serving Christ and leave the future to Him. John Stott said this, All worry is about tomorrow, whether about food or clothing or anything else, but all worry is experienced today. Whenever we are anxious, we, whenever we are, anxious, we are upset in the present time about some event which may happen in the future. 
However, these fears of ours about tomorrow, which we feel so accurately today, may not be fulfilled. The popular advice, don't worry, it may never happen, is doubtless unsympathetic, but perfectly true. People worry that they may not pass an exam or find a job or get married or retain their wealth or succeed in some enterprise, but it's all fantasy. Fears may be liars. They often are. Most worries never materialize. In his second illustration, the Lord uses wildflowers to show the folly of spending one's finest talents in acquiring clothing. When wildflowers grow, they don't labor by gathering the materials or spin thread for clothing. Their natural beauty comes from God. Yet, not even Solomon's finest suits, not even the, all the best clothing that he owned could come close to matching the beauty and splendor that can be seen in one of those wildflowers. So, if God lavishes such beauty on flowers which bloom today and are burned tomorrow, will He be mindful of the needs of His children? Yes, He will be. By worrying whether we have the right kind of shoes, the right kind of suit, the right kind of dress, dress or dresses, we prove ourselves to be little of little faith and without an eternal perspective. Spurgeon said, little faith is not a little fault, for it greatly wrongs the Lord and sadly grieves the fretful mind. To think the Lord who clothes the lilies will leave his own children naked is shameful. Oh, little faith, learn better manners. In the last part of the section, Jesus lets us know the point he's making and also tells us what the solutions are for worry. In verses 29 and 30, we're given the overall point of everything that he just said. As followers of Christ, we shouldn't spend so much effort and worry on things that God has promised to provide. Why? Because worrying will keep us from growing. It will keep us from having an eternal perspective. And it makes us like the unsaved in the world. See, God never intended that His children should spend their time in the mad rush of creature comforts. He has a work to be done on earth. And He has promised to care for those who give themselves wholeheartedly to Him. So in short, worry is unchristian. Worry is a sin. How can we witness to the world and encourage them to put their faith in Jesus Christ when we ourselves are doubting God and worrying? Is it not inconsistent to preach faith and yet not practice it? The late chaplain of the United States Senate, Peter Marshall, once prayed that ulcers would not become the badge of our faith. Sadly, though, too often they are. So, what are the solutions to worry? Well, I see four of them here in verses 30 to 33. The first solution, the disciples are to know that they have a Heavenly Father. This means that you have a Heavenly Father who knows your needs. Therefore, you can trust Him to meet them. You are his sheep in his flock, children in his family, and servants in his kingdom, and he will see to it that your needs are fully met. One day, John Wesley was walking with a troubled man who expressed his doubt as to the goodness of God. He said, I do not know what I shall do with all this worry and trouble. At that same moment, Wesley saw a cow looking over a stone wall. 
Do you know, asked Wesley, why that cow is looking over the wall? No, said the man who was worried. Wesley said, the cow is looking over the wall because she cannot see through it. That is what you must do with your wall of trouble. Look over it and avoid it. See, faith enables us to look past our circumstances and keep our and it helps us keep our focus on Christ. Now secondly, the second solution, the disciples are to seek his kingdom, that is, be about the work of living for and seeking souls for his kingdom. When you're no longer worried and scheming over material things, the best thing you can do is set up one goal and accomplish it. Be part of God's kingdom. Do the work he gives you to do. Concentrate on being God's instruments to, espa- to establish his kingdom here on earth. The third solution to worry. Disciples are not to be afraid and instead are to be resting in the assurances of their heavenly father. Just as he provided for the mission of the 12 and the 72 so he will provide for you. Therefore, surrender your fear. Don't let anxiety rule over you. Don't let it rule over your life. As Pastor Chuck Smith famously said, where God guides, he provides. Therefore, trust the Father. The delight of his life is to find ways to give you not just your daily needs, but his whole kingdom to you. Kingdom heirs don't have to worry about the small stuff. The fourth solution to worry, disciples are to divest themselves of temporal possessions while investing on eternal things. Dedication to Jesus is more than becoming worry-free. It's loving like Jesus and living like Him. So don't depend on your money. Rather, give what you have to the poor. Don't give into the temptation of relying on what's in your wallet or what's in your purses. Everything you have in there will just grow old It'll rot and it'll be destroyed. What you really need to have are wallets and purses that no thief can come near and steal. Such are not earthly, but are heavenly. This kind of eternal wealth can only be obtained by obeying God, practicing His word, following Him to the cross, and trusting Him. By doing so, you'll be storing treasures in heaven, treasures that won't grow old and are inexhaustible. So the bottom line is this. Because they're only temporal, you'll find yourself constantly worried about earthly treasures. Therefore, live life investing in heavenly treasures that will never that you'll never have to worry about now lastly here in verse 34 our lord summarizes the matter where your treasure is there your heart will be also the correlation between where your heart is and the location of your treasure isn't a suggestion it's a simple fact If you regard your material possessions as your treasure, then your heart is set here on on this earth. However, if you regard the eternal rewards that await a faithful believer as your treasure, then your heart is set in God's heavenly kingdom. So here's the question. Where is your heart? 
Now, when the Bible speaks of the heart, it isn't speaking of the organ that's inside your chest that pumps blood throughout your entire blood and throughout your entire body. It's speaking of the center of emotions and mental activities. A large part of your identity is, is thus determined by your heart and where it's at. This means that you can either choose to ignore God and spend your physical, emotional, and psychic energy on the world's goods and earthly success, or you can trust God and spend your efforts on kingdom matters. How you choose to live, though, will depend upon where your heart is. If you want your heart to develop an eternal perspective, it must be cleansed, renewed, and transformed through the power of the Holy Spirit. And this can only happen by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and being born again. You must come to Him, admit that you're a sinner, admit that you're helpless, and that you can't do it on your own. You have to come to Him and empty yourself. And when you empty yourself, He can come in and restore you. But it has to be willingly, and it has to be done sincerely. He knows what's in there, and He knows if you're being sincere or not. But let me tell you, when He comes in, changes your entire life. You will start to have an eternal perspective. You will no longer see life for what it is right now, but you will see it for what it's meant to be. Now, in the next section that we'll be covering, Jesus will cover, will continue the theme of having an eternal perspective. So let's read what our Savior had to say next by picking up in verse 35. Luke chapter 12, verse 35. Be ready for service and have your lamps lit. You are to be like people waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can open the door for him at once. Blessed will be those servants the master finds alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will get ready. Have them recline at the table, then come and serve them. If he comes in the middle of the night or even near dawn and finds them alert, blessed are those servants. But know this, if the homeowner had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also be ready, because the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Lord, Peter asked, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? The Lord said, who then is the faithful and sensible manager his master will put in charge of his household servants to give them their allotted food and proper time. Blessed is that servant whom the master finds doing his job when he comes. Truly I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and starts to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk, that servant's master will come one day he does not expect him, and at an hour he does not know. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unfaithful. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do it, he will be severely beaten. But the one who did not know and did what deserved punishment will receive a light beating. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required, and from the one who has been entrusted with much, even more will be expected. 
in order to help his disciples develop an eternal perspective. Jesus here offered three illustrations to encourage them to be ready and faithful. The first illustration he uses, in the first illustration, he uses another parable to let the disciples know that they're to be like men ready for service with their lamps lit, prepared for the master's return. Well, in verse 36, he tells them that the duty of the master's men is to wait. See, while the master is away celebrating, the servants shouldn't think whether he, if, if he'll return, but when he'll return. And when he does, when he returns, he doesn't want to have to get, get you up out of bed to open the door for him. He wants you at the door, ready, and carry out the tasks he has planned for you. In verse 37, he tells them that their responsibility is to be alert. For those who are ready, what a surprise. No barking of commands, no extra burden of work. Instead, it's a role reversal. The servants will incline at, recline at the table, ready to eat, while the master puts on the servants' clothes, prepares the food, and serves them. What a reward for being ready and for storing up heavenly treasures. The, de the devout German Bible scholar, scholar Bengal, regarded verse 37 as the greatest promise in all of God's word. And in verse 38, he tells them that their challenge is that they don't know the hour he's coming. But no matter what time of day or what time of the night it is, when the master returns, the servant must be alert. He must be alert 24 hours a day seven days a week until he comes. And those whom he finds alert will be blessed by sitting at the table of fellowship with the master. The second illustration, encouraging readiness, pictured a homeowner and a thief. Without spelling the details, apparently a thief had broken into the house of the homeowner Jesus' common sense observation was that if the homeowner had known the time the thief was coming, he would have prevented the break-in. This is an admonition for constant readiness, not only for the disciples at that time, but for us as well, living here and living now. See, Christ, the Son of Man, is coming back just as unexpectedly as the thief came to break in and rob the house. Paul understood this and this was the reason he wrote 1 Thessalonians 5 2. There he says at the well the last part of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 2, the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. The third, the third illustration regarding readiness was prompted by Peter's question as to who the parable was for. Now, Jesus didn't answer Peter directly, which is to say that the teaching is for everyone who understands and applies it. But instead, Jesus introduced another parable by means of a question. Who then is the faithful and sensible manager? The positive answer is the faithful one who's given a task, performs the task, and is therefore blessed by the master. The reward Jesus mentioned here, put him in charge of all his possessions, is a hyperbolic expression. 
what he was implying by this was that the reward will be far greater than the challenges and hazards encountered in his temporal service. The apostles had a special responsibility to feed God's household, his church. But each of us has a task in this world assigned to us by the Lord. Our responsibility is to be faithful by accepting that task, performing that task, and completing that task by the time He returns. So even though we may not appear successful in our own eyes or in the eyes of others, that isn't important. The thing God wants, what He wants from us, is faithfulness. Now, on the flip side, the negative answer to the question is the unfaithful and foolish servant who assumes the master's delay will continue indefinitely. Well, in his false sense of security, he abuses the other servants and chooses to eat and drink and get drunk. However, when the Lord comes back, He will expose the foolishness of that servant's false assumption and false sense of security. The punishment will be that the master will cut him into pieces and assign him a place with the unfaithful. Fake discipleship. Discipleship without dedication to Jesus doesn't fool the Lord. The servant who is unprepared for the master's return will find himself suffering the same punishment that any unfaithful servant would endure. Now to conclude his parable, Jesus then pictured two cases of unprepared servants, a willful one and an unwillful one in verses 47 and 48. The willful, unprepared servant who knew his master's will was severely beaten. But the ignorantly unprepared servant received a light beating. The principal lesson here is that the more one is given, more will be required from them. And the more one is entrusted with, even more will be accept- expected. So simply put, the more we have, the greater our responsibilities. This means that those who knew how to be ready for Jesus' return and yet weren't, will be punished worse than those who didn't know and weren't ready. Regardless though, God will be fair. And in the end, He will hold everyone accountable for the things they knew they must do, but didn't do. Now, in no way was Jesus saying that there are several classes of Christians. There's no, there wasn't uh, genuine ones or committed ones or carnal ones or mere professing ones. Nor was he speaking about the issue of salvation, soteriology. The principal issue in this, in this parable was nothing more, was nothing other than faithfulness. And is meant to point out that managers and servants will either be faithful or they won't. Here, Jesus wasn't giving the disciples a way to test their genuineness or to assure themselves of salvation or eternal rewards. Rather, just as the faithful servants in the parable expected the master to return, Jesus' disciples must live with the expectation that he too will return. So what he wanted them to learn from this all was that if they lived expecting his return, they'll be found faithful and their faithfulness will be rewarded. However, if they live callous, with callous disregard 
they will be found unfaithful and should expect the punishment to be severe. The overall lesson here isn't to provide you with a catalog of rewards and punishments. And it isn't given so that you, you draw conclusions about the relationship of slaves to master or disciples to Jesus. It was told to encourage you to be ready for his return and remain faithful at all times and in all circumstances while we wait for his glorious, for the glorious return of Jesus Christ. The more we prepare ourselves for that moment, the more we will live our lives with an eternal perspective. Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 and 2, So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not earthly things. So here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen. If you want to develop an eternal perspective, these two passages we just read shows us that we must do two things. First of all, we mustn't worry about our basic needs being met. We shouldn't worry about, are we going to eat today? Or what are we, what are we going to eat today? Or what are we going to wear today? Or, or no, you just have to trust that you will eat. God will provide for you. And even if it's clothing from the goodwill, hand-me-downs, He will provide clothing for you. See, God is using us, is using you to accomplish His will and purpose. And as long as you remain faithful to Him and remain focused on the mission He's called you to, He's going to provide what you need, when you need it, at exactly the right time that you need it. He's not done with you until He's done with you. So He's going to provide. He's going to keep you alive. He's going to do. He's work. If He's using you and if you're staying faithful and you're, or being obedient and you're still breathing, that means He's not done with you. And He's going to continue to use you and He's going to provide for you. He's going to make sure that whatever you're going through, whatever your needs are, they're going to be met. Secondly, and vigilant for his return. As faithful servants, we must live every moment of our lives in hopeful anticipation of our Savior's return. He has promised that he will come back, and we must trust in that promise. And we must be prepared. We can't, as believers, we can't sit back, do nothing, and say, ah, you know, I'll just do, I'll make sure I do things before he arrives. And no, that's not the idea here. You must just stand at the door ready, ready for when he does come. Are you paying attention? Are you looking to see what the signs are of his, of his return? Are you paying attention to what's really going on out there? Don't be caught off guard when he does. Don't be, it's better for you. It's far, far much more better for you to be ready when he arrives because he's going to reward you. He's going to reward you that you were faithful and that you, you were ready. He's going to come back. Got to hold on to that promise. Now, before I end, let me ask you, will you be ready when Jesus comes back? When he comes back, in His glory, 
in His majesty. Will you be ready for that? If you're not, but you see that, you now know that you want to be and, and you no longer want to live for the flesh, for the world, then let me lead you in a prayer to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If that's you, if it's safe, bow your head, close your eyes, and pray this. Lord, I come before you now and admit that I'm a sinner. I know now that there's nothing good in me and that my sin was deserving of eternal punishment. So I admit that I can't do it, Lord, that I'm lost and I'm broken. So I come before you at the cross now, at the cross of your Son, on my knees, to ask for forgiveness. I lay all the weight I've been carrying of pain, anger, fear, all the sins I've committed, I lay those before the cross. I confess Him. I believe in Him. Thank you for making me born again. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that, let us know. Get a hold of us. We want to hear from you and we want to lead you into your next steps of this Christian life. It's not meant to be lived alone. There are a lot of people around you that will help you. But yeah, just talk, text us, call us, email us. We want to hear the story. But as I close here now, this message here about n not worrying and about him coming back, I mean, this, we're seeing this played out right now with this whole coronavirus deal, this pandemic. Don't fear. Don't, you shouldn't have any fear. God knows what's going on. Everything's in the palm of his, not, in his hands. He knows the beginning from the end. And you need to understand that through this all, he's trying to show everyone something, but he's also trying to show you something. So pay attention, listen. Don't miss that message because that message can radic will radically transform your life. As I said, He will come back. Be ready when He does. Let's close one more time in prayer. Lord, thank You for today. Thank You for Your Word. Thank You for giving it to us. And now that the seed's been implanted, Lord, I pray that it will just grow, Lord, into what You intended it to be. I pray for this, for everyone watching, listening, that you will encourage them, that you will be with them, that you will love them, that you will strengthen them, Lord, throughout this entire time. May they be a salt and the light in their communities, Lord. Work through them, speak through them, Lord. We pray for our sick loved ones and we pray for the families of those who have already lost uh, family members and friends because of the coronavirus Lord comfort them in their in this time of, of, of grief we pray all these things in Jesus name amen <laughs>